I'm Hugh Collingbourne, Director of Technology with Safa Steel Software. In this video, I'll be explaining the essential details of Ruby's object orientation. For more in-depth information, you should read Chapter 2 of The Little Book of Ruby, which is a free e-book that you can download from our website, www.safasteel.com, along with all the source code of the sample programs. As before, I'll be using the Ruby in Steel IDE but you can use any Ruby editor and run the programs from a command prompt as I explained in the first video in this series. Ruby is a deeply object-oriented language which means that just about everything you do in your programs will require that you use objects. An object is just something you can wrap up data and any code required to work upon that data. So for example if you load the dogs and cats program you'll see that a dog has a bit of data called at my name and it has two chunks of code, that is two methods, called setName and getName, which manipulate the data. SetName takes an argument, uh, ideally the name of a dog, and it assigns its value to the variable at my name. And getName returns the value of the at my name variable. Strictly speaking, you don't need to use the return keyword here. Ruby automatically returns the value of the last expression evaluated. I use return purely for the sake of clarity. You can think of the dog class as a sort of blueprint for creating dog objects. That is, the class itself is not actually a specific dog, but it defines the characteristics of dogs in general. It contains data to represent some feature that is common to all dogs, here the dog's name, and behavior common to all dogs, here how the dog talks, that is, it woofs. When you write your own classes, you need to start the class definition with a keyword class, and end with the keyword end. Give the class a name that begins with a capital letter, and when you write methods, start them with the keyword def. That's D-E-F. And end with the keyword end. Brackets around the arguments are optional, though I prefer to use them. It's conventional to begin method names with a lowercase character. Now, precisely how you name your methods and whether or not you use underscores in the names is entirely up to you. Some Ruby programmers have fiercely strong opinions on naming conventions. Suffice to say, I don't. And I don't intend to get into that debate in these tutorials. In order to create a specific dog object, we need to create a new dog based on the dog class. Now, that's what I do here by calling the new method to construct a dog object. Once I have a new dog object, I can then assign it to a variable, which here I call my dog. I can now call setName, the setName method, to give the dog a name, and I can call other methods to display its name and make it woof. Let me say a bit now about the variable at my name. As I mentioned in my last tutorial, Ruby variables don't need to be pre-declared and don't need to be given an explicit type. The at sign here means that this is an instance variable. Each object created from a class definition is said to be an instance of the class. Each instance, in this case each separate dog object, has its own variables with their own unique values. One at my name variable in one dog object might have the value Fido and in another dog object it could be Rex. So, as the variables are different for each object, that is, each instance of the class, they are called instance variables, and they must begin with the at symbol. Finally, I want to say a bit more about constructing an object. Up to now, I have created a new object by calling the new method after the class name followed by a dot. And only then have I initialized the new object's data, for example, giving a dog a name by calling setName. But what if you want to initialize the data at the time the object is created? Let's see an example of this in the treasure.rb program. Here I want to create instances of the treasure class and when a treasure object is created I want to be sure that it's assigned a name and a description at the time of its creation. To do that I just write a method called initialize. The method name here is important. When a method called initialize exists Ruby automatically calls that method as soon as a new object is created. The initialize method can take zero, one, or more arguments. In this initialize method, I simply create two instance variables, at name and at description, and assign the value of the two arguments to them. So.
So, in short, this is what happens when I create a new treasure object. First, I call treasure.new with the necessary arguments. Notice that I don't call treasure.initialize. You must always call new when creating new objects. If the initialize method exists, it will now be called automatically right after a new object is created. And if any arguments were passed to new, those arguments will be passed on to initialize. The end result, in this case, is that I here create two different treasure objects, and I initialize them with the instance variables of each, uh, those being the strings passed as arguments. The proof of the programming pudding is in the running. So let's run this in the Ruby and Steel console. And there are the true treasure objects that I've created, a sword and a ring with their names and descriptions. Now let's run the dogs and cats program. So I switch back to that and again run it in the console. And there you have it. Two dogs, Fido and Bonzo. One dog with no name. He's explained in the book that goes with these videos, by the way. And just for some variety, a couple of cats too. Remember, you can find more explanation of creating objects in the Little Book of Ruby, along with ready-to-run sample code, all downloadable from www.sapphiresteel.com. In the next tutorial, I'll explain class hierarchies, that is, how to create new descendants of existing classes.